If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Please make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to turn on your notifications so that way you won't miss any of our widely varied video programs, including those with me and my friend Jay Leno. Also, follow us on Instagram at Audrain Auto Museum and Audrain Motorsport. And it doesn't appear. In fact, most of the auto museums do a very poor job of really telling you exactly what they're showing you. They present the cars like pieces of furniture. Here, you, know, you look at it, it looks pretty. It looks almost like the next car next to it. It doesn't really have anything that really makes it stand out. If they told you exactly you know, what was involved in the technical detail, how different the cars are, the, that uh, it would be a lot more interesting, a lot more you know, adventure to, to see what's happened technically in the automotive world. Hello and welcome to the Audrain Automobile Museum here in Newport, Rhode Island and to our new exhibition, Engineering Plus Design Equals Passion, the Nick Begovich Collection. As you just heard in the words of Dr. Nicholas Begovich himself, what really matters is understanding why these cars are important. Dr. Nicholas Begovich was an amazing man with an astonishing career. Born in Oakland, California in November 1921, he was the son of a San Francisco restaurateur. He had a great love of cars from an early age, and when he went to Caltech to get his first of his three degrees there in electrical engineering, he was driving a Plymouth hot rod of his own devising. He put a Winfield cam in it, dual Stromberg 97 carburetors, and dual exhausts something unheard of in a 1930s hot rod, but he was interested in speed and technology and how they came together. In this exhibition, we'll look at the cars he selected, brought together in this amazing collection, and understand why these are important to him. Helping us on this journey is our executive director of the Audrain Automobile Museum, David Demuzio. Good evening, Donald. Hi, David. This is so incredibly exciting. Oh, I'm so happy to have it here, finally. Two years, what, almost two years since we've, we've been thinking about acquiring the collection. Here we are. Cars are finally in the museum to be seen. And it's, it's really something that is, really makes us special, David, is the fact that we were able to acquire these cars from Cal State Fullerton, where Lee and uh, Nick Begovich had donated them as a lead gift to help fund a gravitational wave center. And it's very interesting because the idea of science and engineering and automobiles all come together in a very special way. Lots of people can assemble a group of cars, but a collection always has to have a theme. And in these very varied cars, we're going to see a really powerful theme and the expression of a person. Here at the Audrain, we really like to celebrate the connection that people have with their cars. That's right, and there's lots of different ways you can connect with your car. It may be aesthetic, it may be visceral. I think for Dr. Begovich, it was really uh, his interest in mechanics and engineering that drove uh, the focus in his collection. And it's interesting too, because a lot of people, when they've heard about the collection and the fact that there were so many low mileage cars in the collection, they said, how could somebody love cars and not drive them? But it's all about your point of engagement of passion. That's right. He did drive them, but he also enjoyed probably just as much spending time tinkering on, with them in the garage, in the shop. Learning how they work, why they work, and again, celebrating the solutions that the engineers and designers that, that created these cars made. Now, we're just taking a, a brief overview of what's here. You'll come back to, first of all, some of the uh, YouTube videos on, on this Audrain uh, Museum Network sure. to see some of these cars in motion and you'll get to hear some of those during this video as well because these cars are really very much about the way they sound, the way they respond to the road. I mean, those are the things that were very important to, to Nick Begovich and to us here at the Audrain. Yes. Well, let's, let's, let's start with a very interesting pairing of cars. We're here next to a 1956 Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing. Um, this is a car, of course, that uh, Nick Begovich did not acquire new, but he acquired it in a very interesting way. He was looking for a place to, uh, to store his growing collection and his shop where he did all of his mechanical work. And so he was out one day looking for real estate 
and the agent who showed him the shop that he eventually bought was driving this 300 SL. And he said, well, I'll take the, uh, the building and I'll also take your car. Yeah. And of course, the 300 SL is a perfect Nick Begovich car. It was, in many uh, people's ideas, the first post-war supercar. The, the road-going version of the great 194 uh, race car, it's an amazing accomplishment. Right, a street car that could do over 150 miles an hour in 1956. It's, it's amazing, and the first production mechanical fuel injection application, again, yeah. something that, that Nick Begovich would have really appreciated, uh, the space frame uh, chassis of the car, which yeah. of course necessitated the gull wing doors. And this car also shows um, the way Nick Begovich personalized his cars as well. The car was born a lighter shade of white, and he had it repainted in the 1970s after he bought it in this sort of creamier color, and in a very 1970s California way, you've got this pinstriping along the fender lips, on the rudge wheels, and uh, lots of great little touches like that. Yeah, it's really a special car. Now we're going to take a look at probably one of the stars of the collection. It's hard to, to, to name a star, but this is certainly one of the stars of the collection. This 1964 Porsche Carrera GTS 904. Wow. David, this Porsche 904 is, is a car that, you know, just involuntarily just, just, just makes my heart race. Yeah. Um, this is a car that Nick Begovich bought new in 1964 at the Porsche factory in Stuttgart. Uh, drove it around Germany for a bit uh, just to experience it. We've got wonderful uh, receipts from his uh, lap of the Nürburgring, which Perfect. must have been very had exciting it, in his, right? in his new 904. Yeah. And um, he had it flown back on TWA to, uh, to California. And then he drove it almost not at all. It's got about 1,800 miles from new. It is the most original 904 on the planet. It is remarkable. You could stand here for a long time looking at it. There's just so much speaking to you about the originality of this car. It, uh, it, it is, it's it too is, much. It's it, too much to take in at one time. It's extraordinary. <laughs> and, and one of the things that, that I find so wild about this car is the fact that it doesn't feel like an old car at all. It doesn't smell like an old car. It smells no. like a new car. Yeah. It doesn't drive like an old car. It drives like a new car. Um, and this is actually a moment where I, when we do want to give a, a little bit of a shout out to the folks who uh, recommissioned these cars for the road. It's very, very important for us here at the Audrain that all of the cars in the collection be drivable and be driven. Yes. And uh, these cars, for reasons that we will never know, basically Nick Begovich stopped driving his special cars somewhere around 1980. And uh, they sat, he changed the oil in the cars, he uh, did various other maintenance items, but they were not driven. And some presented larger challenges than others in terms of the recommissioning, but we were able to find specialists to recommission this car, the 300 SL, all the cars in the collection between great specialists uh, here uh, in uh, the US as well as Canada, and of course our own in-house team did a great job as well in, in making these cars roadworthy again in a way that uh, Dr. Begrich would have greatly appreciated, yeah. I think. Um, but this, this in particular, uh, he was a great admirer of, of Hans Ledwinka and the work that he did with Tatra before the war and those amazing designs and, and engineering of those great rear engine sedans, yeah. fast and powerful and really interesting. Yeah, rear and mid-engines, it really drew, drew him to that sort of design. And we see in the collection that there are a lot of mid-engine cars and rear engine cars and um, the whole idea of doing something that is out of the ordinary. Uh, when a manufacturer, especially here with this Porsche, this is the first fiberglass Porsche. Yeah. And um, experimental techniques, and we see some evidence. We'll talk about that in the gallery at some point. But you know, it, it's all original, but it it uh, it has aged in a way that gives it a certain character. You have to explain now. Exactly, and frankly, a character that also speaks so much to the car itself as an artifact. Yes. Um, you know, as, as you said, it shows the experimental technique that, that Porsche used in, in building the fiberglass bodies where they used shredded fiberglass and they mm -hmm. had it blown into a mold. It's something that they didn't do again. Right. Um, but we can see the settling of some of the fiberglass, the way the paint has settled into the fiberglass as well. Uh, and however, because it is so incredibly even and consistent, 
it shows that it is absolutely truly original and, and untouched. It's, it is it's remarkable. An astonishing thing. Truly a remarkable thing. And uh, next, we're going to take a look at another uh, car from this German manufacturer that is rather different, but very much in the same spirit and says, says a lot about Nick Begovich and his passion for cars. Great. David, this 1956 Porsche Speedster was one of Nick Begovich's favorite cars, and it also speaks a lot to Nick Begovich's passion for speed. Now, there's no evidence that he actually raced, but he was a member of the SCCA. Yes. And there is some talk that he did some dry lakes racing before the war when he was young, when he was first in college. But this is, of course, the car that was created for the gentleman racer. It's the car you could buy fairly inexpensively, if not the most inexpensive Porsche of the day. Drive it to the track, race it, and drive it home. Exactly. And uh, Nick Begovich spec this car in a really interesting way. It's got the great sports seats. Yes. And uh, he also bought an accessory hard top for the car as well, which by all accounts was never fitted on the car. Yeah. Again, a very Nick Begovich thing. I want to have it, just like he yeah. ordered a gas heater for the 904, because it's going to be a street car. Yeah, it's essentially um, new old stock, you know? Exactly. It's, it's, it's a great thing. This, this car is covered just about 10,000 miles. So he drove it a good deal when the car was new, and then obviously drove it less as time went on. But it's an amazing car as well because it again shows something that, that I talk about a lot, the, the Italian concept of conservato. It's a car that's been used as a car. At some point in the 1970s, there were probably a few dings and dents in it, so he had some areas touched in with spray, the passenger door was resprayed. But the rest of the car presents as completely original as driven off the showroom floor in Los Angeles in 1956. And it's just an astonishing thing. Again, to drive this car, it's like driving a new Speedster. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is a tribute to what it was that he loved about cars. Again, the idea that the engineering of, of Porsche, uh, Ferry Porsche and Ferdinand Porsche's ideas of what made a lively, fast, quick, nimble sports car, something that really appealed to him. And what was very, again, the uh, sort of the descendant of that wonderful advanced 1930s Tatra engineering yeah. live here in the street. Great handling, lightweight, you don't need a ton of horsepower for this to be competitive. Exactly. And uh, again, it's just one of those things to be able to see a car like this and to experience it is just, I think, something really, really special and speaks a lot to, uh, to Nick Begovich. And we're going to see something now which is completely different than the 300 SL, the 904, and the Speedster, but something that also speaks to a very special side of Nick Begovich. Let's go. Not exotic and not rare but here and here for a reason. This is a 1970 Camaro 350 SS, and it was the very last car that Nick Begovich's first wife, Joan, bought and drove. 85,000 miles on it, and to recommission this car, our team did a lot of work on the suspension and brakes, but it drives like a new car. It's an amazing thing, and this is astonishing. Again, it's a Camaro, right? But Camaro 350 SS. Yeah, also the first year of the Series 2, so a lot of engineering changes would have really appealed to Dr. Begovich. Absolutely. This is a car that handles so much better than the first generation Camaro, yeah. and the, the body is absolutely beautiful. I think it's one of the most beautiful GM designs of the period. Um, particularly elegant without the vinyl roof that you see some of them with, right. and in this very, very simple uh, SS trim. Um, this car also drives amazingly well, and it's fast. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Joan Begovich enjoyed her driving, and I'm sure she enjoy enjoyed driving this very much. And it's also a great uh, example of the kind of documentation that these cars come with. In the glove box of this car is the original uh, dealer delivery slip with her protecto plate, the envelope for the manuals, and all of her Southern California maps, as if we just borrowed the car from Joan Begovich for the day, yeah. and here it is. It's perfect. We'll put, a, we'll put that out on display, I think. Yeah, it, it's, it's an astonishing thing. And again, it also speaks to the passion that Nick Begovich had for the cars. It's an emotional connection as well as an intellectual connection. And that's something that also, I think, set him apart. Um, people think of engineers as sort of being cold and detached. But he was a man who loved opera, loved fine engineering and everything from coffee pots to, to pipes. And, and really was somebody who was really connected with the objects that filled his life. And this Camaro is a great example of that. Yes, absolutely. Now we'll go on to something 
more in the tune of what we were looking at before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, what could possibly be further from the sort of direct approach of a 300 horsepower Camaro SS350 to a Maserati Bora? Now, of course, Nick Begovich, being an electrical engineer and a physicist, had to be drawn to a Maserati V8 aligned with Citroën hydraulics. Perfect. <laughs> A perfect combination. <laughs> what could you do that would be more complex than this and would, would just appeal to, to, to the mind of the scientist? It's just perfect for his criteria for collecting. Mid-engine, stunning design by Giorgetto Giugiaro, and just this amazing combination. The roadability of a Bora is something that really has to be experienced. Um, people have been afraid of these cars for a long time because of the Citroën connection. Um, but nonetheless, the Citroën connection with this is really limited to the brakes, the pedals, um, and uh, that doesn't have the hydraulic suspension right. of a Citroen SM, for instance, which is surprising. We were chatting about that. It sort of seems that a guy like Nick Begovich would have bought a Citroen SM, but you yeah. also mentioned the fact that, you know, he's not really a GT guy, he's more of a no. sports car guy. This is so it. This is the one. This is more hardcore than an SM would have been. And I think this is one of the coolest cars of the period. When they were brand new, I absolutely love these cars. And they had so many features that sort of really reinforce that cross alpine feeling. The interior is very Italian and very French. Um, the design of this period, especially in this car, is a mixture of the sort of sensuous curves of the 1960s uh, with the wedge of the 1970s, sort of thrown together in a really compelling way. Yeah, I think it really, the lines really have stood the test of time. Yeah, it's an astonishing thing. And uh, one of the things that also is, is so neat is the fact that Nick Begovich also loved vanity plates. And this car is a wonderful California blue vanity plate, 74 Bora. It's there like, it is. It says it all. He wanted people to know, this is what I'm driving. Here yeah. I am. And uh, similarly of the period is, again, another solution mid-engine to the same challenge of a mid-engine GT sports car. Let's take a look at this. Sure. David was so great about doing this, the fact that both of us are grinning like absolute idiots because love, love, it's just, it's, love it. Just it, love it, this it's car. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, 1973, De Tomaso Pantera, which Nick Begovich bought new in uh, LA. And just the wonderful Italian American, what we used to call hybrids before uh, it was about propulsion. The idea of an American engine in an Italian chassis and body, just the perfect combination of power and elegance, handling, um, everything that you wanted. This is going to be Ford's great Corvette fighter. Um, mm. It didn't work out very well for a couple of reasons, I think, because Lincoln Mercury dealers had no idea what to do with a car like this or how to sell it to the people that wanted it. And Alejandro de Tomaso was basically an impossible person to get along with by anybody. Right. Was a Pantera to compete with Ferrari? The Corvette. It was all, the idea that you could get an exotic Italian car for $10,000 when a Ferrari would be $20,000. Now, of course, I'll take all the brand new Ferraris of $20,000 you can have. Right. $20,000 in 1973 was a heck of a lot of money. Yeah. And this was an amazing bargain for the time. And one of the things also about this, um, again, going to the archive, it's just so wonderfully illustrative of Nick Begovich. He takes delivery of his car, he really likes it, but he writes a letter to the De Tomaso distributors in Detroit saying, oh, by the way, you know, in the owner's manual, the layout of the controls is not the same as they are actually in the car, and you should change that. And, oh, by the way, when I'm driving the car, the temperature gauge operates at basically the maximum of 230 uh, degrees, but that doesn't make any sense because the car has an 18 PSI pressurized cooling system with 40% glycol, so the boiling temperature should be about 260, so you should really either fit another gauge or figure out what to do about that. Right. There's no record in the archive of the response he received, however. Um, but, you know, again, that's typically Nick Begovich. Right. You know, and the I get this car and, and I'm going to improve it. Yeah, and the gauge still doesn't function properly, just, just as he noted. Exactly. And, uh, but the driving experience of this car is absolutely amazing. I mean, this should have been a world beater. And the fact that Ford only sold it for three years didn't mean the car died. Of course, De Tomaso continued to produce this car for another two decades. Right. Um, so, uh, and the Ford 351 Cleveland was, was an awesome engine. Exactly. It's, 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 it's a great thing. And as a matter of fact, there's a wonderful um, story in the uh, 
Litton Data Industries uh, newsletter, News and Views, I think it's called, uh, about the president of the company and his car collection. And it ends with, you know, if you see this bright yellow Pantera come roaring into the parking lot and goes into the president's space, you know Nick Begovich has arrived at work. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great thing. Again, however, he lived basically a mile from the office most of his life. So again, this car has under 3,000 miles on it. Yeah. So yeah. it's, and again, the, And the best Pantera. color for a Pantera, in my opinion. Classic. Yellow. Classic. Absolutely. Now, we're going to go see another classic, but one that's really rather unknown, even though it's a production car. This is a, another Nick Begovitz special. I love this one, too. Now, David, this car speaks to me on so many levels. Uh, the first one, of course, is the fact that Nick Begovich, I understand exactly why he was drawn to this turbocharged Corvair. The fact that a big company like General Motors would actually take the step of turbocharging their rear engine uh, sporty car was something that I'm sure absolutely appealed to him, being the Porsche enthusiast that he was. Perfect. And the fact that this 1962 uh, Corvair Monza Spider Club Coupe with 150 horsepower actually outperformed all the 356s of the time, except for the Carrera 2-4 cam. So this is an amazing car, and of course, it also speaks to me because my first car was a Corvair, a 63 awesome. Corvair Monza. So this is just one of the neatest cars I think on the planet. Very cool. And the Spider, why do they call it a Spider? Well, it's really funny because we think of Spider as an open car, but Spider referred to the turbocharger. Now, that's sort of just GM marketing people thinking, well, Spider sounds European and, 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 and chic, so we'll use Spider. Right. But yeah, it confuses a lot of people. It's like, a Spider? Wait, it's a hard top. What's right. up with that? And uh, one of the other things about this car is that it is in as-aged condition. The body panels are absolutely straight. The paint, which notoriously for this period, faded like crazy. It was, it was quite common for people to repaint their cars after four or five years. Right. Nick Begovich didn't repaint this car. It just yeah. slowly faded into the state that it was in. And one of the challenges that we had here in making the decisions about how to recommission the cars is what do you do with the cars? Uh, we'll come to a discussion about two of the other cars and a third car in the collection in a minute. But we made the decision together that we wanted to leave this exactly the way it was. We didn't want to do any uh, uh, color sanding or, or, God forbid, repaint the car. Right. Because we wanted it to present the way it is, the way it's lived, like, like an old sweater, like right. a great old tweed jacket. You could even say it has beautiful patina. It does. It does indeed. I, I love this car. It's yeah. fantastic. Absolutely amazing. Can't wait to get out on the road. Yeah, one of my favorite too. That'll be a lot of fun. Our next car is a car that has a very interesting connection, much like the 300 SL, in that it was not a car that Nick Begovich bought new, but it's a car that clearly pulled at all of his uh, emotional connections. Let's go. I love Alfa Romeos. I know that, Donald. And the Giulietta Sprint Speciale is one of the most spectacular post-war Alphas ever made. And the fact that this was one of the Berlinetta Aerodynamica Technica cars for the street, the famous BAT uh, display cars that were made in the 1950s. Actually, they weren't display cars, they were concept cars because they were running yes, right. uh, Alpha 1900s that explored how far you could go in terms of getting a great coefficient of drag in a producible car. Right. And uh, so you can imagine, again, that the engineer and scientist, Nick Begovich, would be absolutely fascinated by one of these cars. And this is a car he did not buy new. Right. Um, a friend of his was storing it with him and stored it for so long he said, you know, either I need to buy this car or you need to get it out. And so he ended up buying the car. Um, this is also an interesting example in that it's a great example of something which was quite common at the time. These cars came standard with a 1300cc engine and this car has been replaced with a 2 liter version of the engine from a later Alfa Romeo right. and uh, a 5 speed gearbox in place of the original uh, four-speed gearbox. And so it's very much a driving car. And it's been given a paint job, probably back in the 1960s, um, of an average character, but of the period. And it's just a car still that displays the, the incredible elegance of line that these cars have. And, and, and the solution of, of aerodynamic design is just yeah, astonishing. Not a straight line on the body of this car. It curves everywhere. Everywhere, in all directions. The windshield even curves in three directions. It's, it's the, the rear window, it's, it's an astonishing yeah. thing. And another example of the fact that when these cars are restored, 
and taken apart, it's really, really difficult to get these panels to align the way they do on this car, which has never been taken apart. So it, it's really a, um, uh, quite the testament to the Alpha designers, to uh, Franco Scaglione, who designed uh, the, this car. And uh, we'll see another uh, very interesting Scaglione design in a bit. But we mentioned the fact that you know, these cars were original cars, very original cars, recommissioned for the street. Now, there are two cars that are part of the collection which are not here in the gallery. And let's just take a minute to talk about those because those are really extraordinary examples of the automotive art. Sure, let's go. We're sitting down because we needed to take a break from the cars in the collection that have been recommissioned for the road. <laughs> Because no, no, there are... really, it's just been a long week installing the show, <laughs> and we're tired. That, too. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to sort of sit in this corner, because we had a long discussion about how we would include two cars that are in the collection, but not present here in the gallery. Right. And so we've made this, this little corner as a tribute to two extraordinary cars, two Pegaso Z102s. Now, that's going to be one of those things. Pegaso, what the heck Who is even, that? Whoever even heard of one. Yeah. Exactly. Pegaso was an amazing sport, sports car built in Spain in the early 1950s by Enasa, which is the Spanish National Truck Company. Uh, Wilfredo Ricart, who had been the chief engineer of Alfa Romeo before the war and during the war, who was responsible for the great Alfa 8C 2900s and their wonderful competition cars, um, left Italy after World War II and went back to his native Spain, where things were a little more friendly for him politically, shall we say. And um, he was engaged by the government to bring up the level of the talent of the engineers of the National Truck Company. So he thought, what better way to do that than to embark on a world-beating sports car project? Well, and so they said, why not? Yeah, well, he certainly had the talent to do it. He did, and indeed, and the cars that they created they only made 76 Pegasos in a four-year uh, production span. And this collection included two of them. Uh, one is this beautiful uh, Touring GT, uh, bodied by Corotteria Touring of uh, Turin, Italy. A very elegant, but very capable car. The other is an Anasa-bodied lightweight racing car which was one of the three entered by Pegaso in the 1952 Monaco Grand Prix for sports cars. The Monaco GP that year was not held for, for open single-seaters, right. but for sports cars. And three of them went to the race. Only one of them managed to qualify, and it's the car in this collection. Remarkable. And they're both currently undergoing restorations because they were undergoing restoration by Nick Begovic uh, when the collection was acquired. Uh, in fact, Nick worked with his, uh, his mechanic and restorer on this car, the Touring Body car, for 25 years and never quite finished it. Again, one of those things that, that Begovic was the kind of guy who loved working on things. Actually, finishing them was not that important as the process. He loved the process. Right. We love to see it, too. It's, it's, uh, it's something we, were gonna, we want to share with people uh, when, once they're finished is the whole process, seeing the car all apart, seeing all the... In intricate things that go on during restoration is really another story we want to tell. And you learn so much about the cars who created them and why yeah. during that process. Restoration is not for everybody. Right. <laughs> uh, I know that, uh, and, and, and our members know that your background is in furniture restoration and, and history. And so I know that you find this as fascinating as I do. Yeah, this is my favorite part of old cars. And with the old cars, when you do all of that, you also get to then experience them as the makers intended. And it'll be very exciting to see both these cars back out on the road, uh, shared as we do with the Audrain at shows internationally and at tours and rallies and events. So it'll be very, very exciting. And again, something that I think will make Nick Begovic very, very proud to see all of his very hard work, his long research realized and back on the road. Right. When are they going to be done? Not soon enough, but soon. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's take a look at something else, which, again, is extremely rare. It's actually a one of one, and it's also in very original condition and has a connection with a great friend of the Audrain that actually helped bring the collection here. Take a look at a very special French car. Let's go. This car in the collection is quite interesting because it has a story of a great compulsion 
of Nick Begovich's, but a disappointment of his as well. And this car, part of the collection, was loaned to us by Jay Leno. Um, it's part of his collection. He was the one who steered us to uh, Cal State Fullerton and uh, the acquisition of the collection. And uh, he purchased this car from the collection with the promise that it would come back for our exhibition. We're very grateful for Jay for uh, keeping his promise and, and, and letting us have this very, very special car. Um, Nick Begovich, again, knowing that he loved design engineering, the Talbot Lago story is a really fascinating one. Uh, Anthony Lago saves the Talbot company. He's sort of a, an, an, an adventurer, much in the mold of sort of Alejandro de, de Tomaso. He could talk anybody out of a lot of cash very, very quickly. In and the 1930s? In the 1930s, he took over the company, um, and he managed to make it through the 1930s with some really terrifically engineered and manufactured competition cars. After the war, it was very, very tough for French manufacturers of luxury cars because of really excessive taxation. And these were big, expensive cars. And so he kept developing the pre-war racing models into the post-war models. This is a Talbot Lago GSL Grand Sport Long on the long wheelbase. There are only 19 of these cars made, all with the same factory body, but this is a unique one because it's the only one fitted with a manual four-speed gearbox. All the rest are pre-selected gearboxes. So this was, it is believed, a car that was made for rally competition to, to see if they can get back into the uh, competition business with the long wheelbase car to establish it as a market presence. Um, the, they made a short wheelbase car, the Grand Sport, that was bodied very flamboyantly by a number of coach builders. Uh, they were, again, extremely expensive and really didn't find the market that, that Talbot Lago needed to find. Um, what's interesting about this in the Begovich collection is the fact that Nick Begovich longed to have one of the pre-war teardrop coupes by Fagone and Falaschi. And incredibly beautiful cars, incredibly capable. The true uh, example of a race car and a Boulevardier body. Yeah. Just absolutely amazing cars. Yeah, we saw, we saw a lot of little photographs, clippings, notes taken in, in the archive. He was definitely searching for that car. And he traveled often to Europe for business, and so he was always on the search, and on one of his trips to France, he was told about this car, and again, sort of the competition um, planning for this car, the four-speed gearbox appealed to him, and he thought, well, okay, I can't find a teardrop, so I'll buy this car instead. Mm -hmm. Shipped the car back to uh, California, and there's no evidence that he actually ever drove it. He picked the car up at the docks, it had a temporary sticker, to register it, to get it from the docks to Fullerton. And by all accounts, he just parked it and left it there until uh, the collection was sold. And uh, Jay and his team have done a wonderful job of recommissioning this car. Um, you can see great videos of this on the Jay Leno Garage uh, YouTube channel. Right. And uh, he took me for a very spirited fast ride on the 405 freeway in this car. And it just wants to go. It is a real competition car. So uh, I think that it's sort of a shame that uh, Maybe Nick thought, this isn't really what I want, so I can't really connect with it. Which again, tells us a lot about his character, but he didn't sell it. He knew that it was something special and he wanted to keep it around. So it really, it stayed in the warehouse for 45 years unknown. Exactly. Which is one of the very interesting things as well. Um, uh, Peter Larson and Ben Erickson, uh, who wrote uh, the definitive book on Talbot Lago Grand Sports, didn't actually know this car existed because it's been sitting in Nick Begovich's garage yeah. in Fullerton so for 40 book. years. It's not so in the book. It's not in the book. It's, yeah. it's an amazing discovery and the kind of thing that really brings a collection like this to life. And uh, speaking of bringing things to life, <laughs> the collection includes one of the most exciting supercars of the 1960s and an amazing example of it, which Nick bought new. Let's take a look. Excellent. Well, the definition of a supercar is something that can fill many evenings or afternoons uh, between friends and former friends. Uh, we talked about the 300 SL certainly being a post-war supercar, but for most people, the modern supercar began with the Lamborghini Miura. That's right. And of course, Nick Begovich, being a fan of low, sleek, elegantly designed, fast, mid-engine cars would have to have a Lamborghini Miura. He bought this car new in Rome in 1967. And again, a very funny thing. 
it was flown home to California from Frankfurt. But he went to Rome, stayed at the Hotel Excelsior, bought this car, loved it, then had a factory driver drive the car from Rome up to Frankfurt to be shipped home to LA. You would think that would be a trip I'd certainly take, but Oops. perhaps Nick didn't have the time to do it. Right. But he certainly loved the car. There's a wonderful piece of correspondence in the archive, a letter he wrote to Ferruccio Lamborghini saying he was going to be in Italy on business uh, a few months later, and he'd love to come and meet him, visit the factory, talk to the technicians, and oh, pick up some spare parts, some gaskets and hoses and things like yes, that. Yes, he had a whole list. It was really interesting to read. Exactly, and it, it's, it's an astonishing thing, and it ties into this whole mechanical connection with his cars. Mm -hmm. Even though they've covered very low mileage, this car, again, has about 3,700 kilometers yeah. on it from new. He still was very connected with the cars. Yeah. Um, when he bought the 904, he ordered it with a Nürburgring gearing, which when he got back to California, quickly discovered that, you know, what you need for the Nordschleife is not right. what you need for Fullerton. <laughs> so he ordered a complete different set of gears for his 904 from the Porsche factory and also instructions on how to install them properly and all this. So he was very connected physically with the cars. Yeah. And, and uh, buying spare parts, anticipating that he may need them. Precisely, because yeah. again, he's an engineer. Right. You don't want things to break and not to be able to, to fix them. Plus, again, it gave him the insight into how the car worked. And of course, this was a car that would absolutely appeal to him because the chassis of this, the packaging is absolutely astonishing. People who haven't experienced the Miura in person are shocked the first time they see one because it's so incredibly low. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, you just wonder, how do you actually get everything this car needs in this very, very small, low shape? Right. And uh, it's also got a number of great special features. Most Mioras came with vinyl interiors, although most of the restored ones today have very opulent leather interiors. This is the only Miura ever delivered with a complete cloth interior. Yeah, which in, is in pristine condition. It's, it's remarkable. It, it is astonishing. And again, to drive this car is just such an incredible pleasure. It, it's, a very, it's a car that's very physical. Mm. It requires real physical input. And that's something that also, I think, really uh, piqued uh, Nick Begovich's interest because a lot of the cars in the collection are cars that you have to drive with intent. They're not cars to sort of cruise around in. Right. It was not Nick Begovich, I think, uh, and his personality. And we were, we were talking about how having, having had the luxury of driving a car like this that has never been restored or taken apart, as opposed to many of the other mirrors that we see and driven that have been completely taken apart, and how they, they feel completely different when you drive them. Absolutely. The, the folks at the factory, the Santaca de Bolognese, who built this car, would recognize the way every one of these parts were put together. And the, um, we got the comment, as we did on so many of the other cars in the collection, uh, the shop that recommissioned this car said it was amazing. It was like working on a brand new car. Right. You took things apart. Well, that looks great. Clean it, put it back together. And, and that's it. And uh, that's something else that, that is a real tribute to these cars, their build quality and the intent that Nick Begovich had. Um, now we're going to see another car, which has an extremely long history with Nick Begovich and tells a really fascinating story as well about his engagement with cars. Let's, Let's take go. a look at this. Yeah. Now we're here next to what is probably your favorite, if not your favorite car, the car that you have the deepest connection with. That's right, like this the Corvair to you. Exactly. My father had a slightly later version, the XK150, 59, the year I was born, uh, came home from the hospital in it. Um, he was also an electrical engineer with a lot of the same curiosities and interests as Nick Begovich. So I really connect to it in that way. Uh, but when I see, I see the wonderful lines of this car, even though the, I think they're better than the XK150, it's still, um, it's like going down memory lane for me. And it's something that uh, makes perfect sense. We were just talking about uh, Nick Begovich's pursuit of a teardrop coupe. And the design of this car is so incredibly influenced by those pre-war teardrop coupes, the aerodynamic shape. And for me, the 120's perfect expression is in the fixed head coupe, Absolutely. where you get that line, yeah. um, which is so incredibly magical. This was Nick Begovich's second Jaguar. His first foreign car was a 1951 Jaguar Mark IV. And um, it, is, it is an amazing thing that, one of the things as well in the archive for this car is a letter from William Lyons, the founder and head of Jaguar, 
congratulating Nick Begovich on his purchase of this car in 1952. It's an amazing thing, and it also speaks to Nick Begovich's position already in his industry. The fact that he was an important enough person for William Lyons to write a letter to. Interesting. Um, and Nick Begovich was an interesting person because he was not shy about using his position in corresponding with the world and sort of getting what it was that he wanted. Right. There's lots of letters written on used aircraft letterhead. I noticed signed, that. Signed yeah. uh, Nicholas Begovich, Senior Vice President. Yes. Um, and I think that's not a bad thing necessarily. It's the fact that he wanted people to know, I'm serious. I'm yeah. a serious guy. I, I, I buy serious cars. I'm interested in them in a serious way. And this, of course, is also the high-performance version, the XA120M. So it's got the head from the uh, C-Type. From the C-Type, yes. Uh, and it is astonishing to drive. You think about the level of performance in 1952 and 1953 that this car offered, the performance, the handling. Um, it, it was absolutely otherworldly, especially compared to a lot of the American cars on the market at the time. It was just in a league of its own. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful example. And in, in British racing green, as they call it. The perfect, uh, perfect car. Um, our last car that we're going to feature is arguably my favorite, although I can't pick favorites in this, but it just speaks so much to how important Nick Begovich's collection is and his incredible eye. Let's take a look. Well, David, the final car of the selection here in the gallery is this 1964 ATS 2500 GTS. This is a car you can almost be guaranteed that any visitor guest who comes into the gallery or the people watching this video likely will never have seen in their lives. This is a car made by a company, Automobili Turismo e Sport, which was founded by a group of people who left Ferrari uh, in, in a snit because they didn't like the way his wife, Laura, interfered in things at the factory and the way things were run. And they knew that they could go out and do it better because these were the guys who had created the Ferrari 250 GTO, the Formula One World Championship winning Shark Nose Ferrari 156, and they could make a world-beating GT sports racer and a Formula One car. Carlo Chitti, Giotto Bizzarini, uh, and they were backed by some very wealthy uh, businessmen, and unfortunately, the entire thing lasted three years. The Formula One team didn't work out, the car was half-baked, they built by some estimates, nine of the road cars, uh, three of which were lightweight alloy racing cars, and the entire thing just went away. Uh, Carlo Chitti went on to found Auto Delta, which became the performance racing arm for Alfa Romeo, right. and the basic architecture of this car and the engine was developed into the world-beating Alfa 33, the Tipo 33. Wonderful car. Um, and so the fact that <laughs> Nick Begovich bought this car, he's the second registered owner of this car from New, and this is one of the prizes in his collection. There are many photographs of him in period with this car, working on this car, correspondence about this car, trying to figure things out because, again, extremely rare cars. It's thought that five of these exist today. They actually had a reunion of the five X and ATSs at Begovich's garage a number of years ago, something which we are working on doing here again in Newport next year in the uh, 2022 uh, yes. Audrain Newport Concours and Motor Week, which will be amazing and Absolutely. exciting. Absolutely. And this is a car that should have been an absolute world beater. It was the second production mid-engine car ever, preceded only by two days by the Matra Jet, and features a double overhead cam V8 engine. Uh, this is the three liter version, came in three liter and two and a half liter versions, uh, producing 260 plus horsepower and a very lightweight alloy body designed by Franco Scaglione. It's just, it's everything. It so, is absolutely everything. It sounds like a handful, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quiet, quiet touring. This would not <laughs> offer. But it's, again, no wonder that, that, that uh, Nick Begovich was drawn to this car. So incredibly rare, so incredibly beautiful, and so incredibly well executed. Yeah, and it has a, a lot of information in the archive about this car. Lots of drawings, sketches he did by hand. He was very much engineering solutions for this car. He spent a lot of time and effort thinking and working on this car. It's very clear 
with all the information we have in, in the archive. This is a car that absolutely spoke to him. We look at the pictures of the chassis of this car. And again, like the Miura, um, like the 904, they're amazing solutions to the challenges of a mid-engine, high-performance car, in this case, a sports racing car. And as you said, the, the wonderful thing is looking at the archive at all of his sketches and his little drawings of individual parts and, and everything written very, very carefully noted in that wonderful tiny engineer's hand. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing tribute to both the builders of these cars, the fact that he was so interested in what made them be. Yeah. And we can enjoy them simply as very pretty objects, but remembering his challenge to us. Yes. Our job is to bring what's underneath the skin to every visitor guest that comes to see this exhibition. And we hope that we'll be able to do that in a way that will please both Nick and satisfy us because yes. these are cars that all tie together in a way that a group of cars is just a group of cars, but a collection is far more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. This is an amazing collection of cars that you will enjoy here at the Audrain Automobile Museum from November 20th through February 20th, 2022. We hope to see you here in the gallery or here on the Audrain Museum Network to enjoy some of the videos of these cars in motion and come and see what it is that drove Nick Begovich to assemble this collection and for us to be able to preserve, celebrate, and share them with you. Take me for a drive. Absolutely, let's go.